one of the most enigmatic and recognisable symbols of Ireland, along with the Celtic High Cross design, are the Round Towers of Ireland. Dozens of these immense and impressive structures stand proud over the Irish landscape and have done so for millennia. According to Christians, these are early religious round towers built by monks to venerate the death cult of the Middle East, known as Christianity. Along with the origin of the Irish High Cross, this is another Abrahamic deception. Join me for the next half an hour as we explore the true origins and purpose of the Druid Towers of Ireland. In May 2016, a vital piece in the puzzle of my exploration between the strange crossover period, Druidic Ireland and Christian Ireland, revealed itself to me while travelling across a little known but highly significant megalithic landscape north of Kalala in County Mayo on the west coast of Ireland. I was on a trip to photograph and measure a tall, thin standing stone facing out towards the North Atlantic next to the empty and picturesque golden sands of Lacken Bay at Caratronassa. Expecting to find yet another interesting standing stone, the journey to and from the charming fishing village of Kilala turned into something of an adventure and a revelation at the same time. I was not expecting this to happen when I plotted out the route on my ordnance survey map. However, as with so many of my journeys to such places all over Europe, a sense of connected migration from this reality to another took place. I was being lured to the region. It was finding me. I did not find it. From the standing stone at Karachunasa Bay, it became very apparent to me that this was a sacred consecutive landscape of Neolithic Bronze Age and early Christian, or so I assumed at the time, sacred sites leading from the Cade Fields Neolithic complex on the north coast of the county all the way down to the town of Ballina. At the centre of all this was the picturesque and beautiful Round Tower of Kalala. Ask any theologian or archaeologist if they can produce evidence, written or otherwise, to indicate that the mysterious Round Towers of Ireland were built by Christian monks, and you'll be presented with the same answer. There is no evidence that the Irish Round Towers have a Christian origin. To add to this mystery even further, why were the Round Towers of Ireland not destroyed along with other structures at Irish abbeys with the dissolution of the monasteries started by Henry VIII in 1536? If they were indeed ecclesiastical structures, surely they would have made an easy if not highly symbolic target for demolition. The symbolic significance of tearing down the most impressive structure in a Christian abbey would have been too tempting not to do. Yet they were left alone, while churches and other religious buildings adjacent to them were demolished or made unusable. 
Not a single round tower in Ireland was touched. Why? The obvious answer is that they were not considered Christian buildings and therefore were not targeted for destruction. The example in Kalala offers much evidence that we are dealing with pre-Christian structures built for the very specific purpose which remains a profound mystery to this day. In actuality, these Irish round towers should be called Druid Towers. As evidence suggests, they were built long before St. Patrick set foot in Ireland and perhaps older than Christianity itself. Although Christian scholars will deny this and then protest their antiquity, in reality, more hard evidence exists that the famous Irish round towers were built before Christianity arrived in Ireland and not after. The impressive round tower at Kalala itself looms over the village dominating the countryside and is not only a sublime piece of beautifully executed engineering, but also creates a distinct sensation from its stonework as if the structure is acting as some form of antenna, an effect long known to Irish farmers who have grazed their livestock on the grass adjacent to round towers due to the high fertility and high yield rates of the surrounding agricultural land. The round tower at Kalala stands atop a hill in the centre of the village and at over 20 metres high is clearly visible when approaching from all directions. The tower rests on a plinth-like structure of two dozen stones of varied size. The plinth is surprisingly modest in scale considering the huge structural load it has to carry. With a circumference of just under 16 metres and a south southeast facing entrance approximately three meters off the ground. Interestingly, the four windows at the top are orientated just off the cardinal points. There is also a rather strange bulge in the structure, about halfway up, which was a result of a direct lightning strike in 1779. Otherwise, the tower is perfectly straight from top to bottom along all exterior surfaces. And this precise engineering is typical of all Irish round towers. This design represents a very high quality level of masonry for the period. There is no evidence that the internal part of the tower ever contained ladders, staircases or floors. These ideas are purely subjective. Although this is difficult to fully determine, there may well have been interior wooden compartments connected to one another as part of the original construction. Or, even more tantalizing, perhaps the conical caps at the top of the towers were later added by Christians and in fact, perhaps some kind of platform sat atop the tower where a druid could perform spiritual, magical or other ceremonies. Perhaps the charging of sacred objects through lightning strikes, exposure to the moonlight or sunlight. The tower was located on the site of a monastery, we are told, founded by St. Patrick, who was believed to have been captured and held prisoner by the Druids there as a young man. Before his release and eventual return to appoint St. Murdica as the first bishop of the abbey, the site was chosen because of the Druid's holy well, which still exists and which flows into the sea nearby. The description of St. Murdica himself is interesting, as he was described as an elderly man and also a hermit who lived on a remote island known as Inishmurri off the coast of Sligo. Another interesting fact is that St. Murdica was a close family member of Lyra who died in AD 462 and is generally recognised as one of the last powerful heathen kings of Ireland who ruled from Tara. Considered to be a great enemy of St. Patrick, Lyra's own story is resplendent with supernatural battles involving Druids and Christians. In fact, the entire landscape around Kalala Bay, including the impressive hill of Cross Patrick and the cliffs around Down Patrick, 
are recalled in local legend as major battle sites between the Druids in the service of the Crom, the ancient and last non-Christian god of Ireland, and St. Patrick and his Roman forces. Nearby in the church grounds at Kalala is a large souterrain, which is a type of underground man-made cave found all over Ireland and in western France. And there is an entrance into a beehive-shaped structure under the ground. The souterrain is constantly flooded and exploration is difficult, but there is a long passage which leads in the direction of the Round Tower, and local folklore clearly maintained that the Round Tower itself can be entered by means of an underground passageway leading from the souterrain to the interior of the tower itself by means of travelling underneath the present Christian church. The souterrain itself was extensively explored in 2016, apart from the sections which appear to have collapsed or have been walled up. And on the ceiling inscribed in one of the stones is what is described as being a Christian cross, although it looks much closer in resemblance to a Druidic cross petite, which is in actual fact a kind of swastika and is found all over Ireland and Celt Iberia and is commonly and unfortunately misnamed as being early Christian crucifixes when they are nothing of the sort. The souterrain running under the ground and emerging into the round tower brings up some very interesting aspects in terms of functionality not just only spiritual possibilities. Was the round tower used for collecting some kind of energetic force or substance from the air, which was then routed on the ground by means of the souterrain, where it was collected or utilized in some way by entering the souterrain? The fact that the round tower is built upon the highest point in the village and is visible for miles around, even far out into the Atlantic, must hold some significance too. The round tower at Kalala, in every way, is connected directly and symbolically with the heathen and pagan ritual landscape around it, and remains so to this day, as it still stands long after the Christian abbey which claimed it was a part of has long since vanished. And yet we find this at round towers all over Ireland. This early Victorian illustration of the round tower in Clondalkin in the suburbs of Dublin was until the 19th century considered pre-Christian. No one dared to assume that Irish round towers were Christian in origin. It was only in the 19th century and specifically in the last hundred years and even more so after the formation of the Irish Free State when Jesuit orders took direct control of Irish antiquities and education that the Irish Round Towers began to be referred to as Christian structures. Yet there is not, as I had mentioned, one single record of any abbey or monastic institution which makes reference in their documents, which often are very complex and cover every other aspect of monastic life, referring to the construction of the round towers on their own property. There are approximately 70 round towers still standing in Ireland today. Their purpose has never been fully determined. Considering their antiquity at the time of their construction, they would have been considered among the tallest buildings erected in Europe, and their design and engineering would have been on par with the buildings of the great Neolithic structures, such as Stonehenge, in terms of procuring available resources and technology. Some round towers are well over 30 meters high and would have been the skyscrapers of Atlantic Europe back in their day and are all built far away from what we are told was the main power base in Europe at the time, that being Rome. One of the most distinctive design elements of the round towers is that they all have an entrance door usually around 4 meters 
above the ground. The standard academic reason for this strange feature is that the Christian monks would use a ladder to escape into the tower along with their valuables during raids by the Vikings. This is clearly absurd to the point of utterly preposterous, as the Viking raiders would have just lit a large fire at the base of the tower to both asphyxiate the monks inside while undermining the exterior wall construction, bringing the entire structure crashing down. It would make far more sense for the monks to grab the valuables and run off into the nearby ample woodlands which covered Ireland at the time. One of the reasons that makes the precise dating of the round tower so difficult, apart from the fact that they are not comparable to anything similar elsewhere in Europe, is the continual and ongoing restoration, repairs and refinements which took place from the Middle Ages onwards. Details were later added which are clearly medieval in style and thus have given a false impression of their actual antiquity. The very famous and beautiful round tower at Glen the Lock in County Wicklow is one of the most attractive and impressive round towers in all of Ireland. Peeping out above the tree line of a dense woodland among surrounding cliffs and mountains, it has been the subject of countless drawings, photographs, painting, and has even been featured in numerous movies and television shows. Along with Cashel, which also has an impressive round tower amid a complex of ecclesiastical buildings, the valley at Glendalough in Wicklow was considered a sacred landscape long before the arrival of Christianity. And when the Vikings arrived in nearby Dublin, they chose the trees of Glendalough to build their longships from. They recognized the location as a place where the old gods of the forest streams and mountains still dwelled. Like all the round towers of Ireland, they conform within an almost rigid set of design specifications. As George Lennox Barrow at the turn of the 20th century noted, We may well conclude that most of the towers were the work of teams of builders who moved from one monastery to another using standard designs. In terms of defensive purposes, they are utterly useless, and as bell towers, their small windows at the top would have muffled the sound of the bell rather than amplifying it. All the round towers were built initially as freestanding structures, although later Christian buildings were often grafted onto them. Over a dozen of the still surviving towers have a conical cap, and the logical assumption is that all round towers once had the same capping, and which was subsequently has been destroyed by perhaps lightning strikes and or natural weathering over the many centuries they have stood standing in the Irish landscape but this is by no means a certainty. The conical caps may well have been added by the Christian monks in the medieval period. The basic cement used to bond the granite blocks of the round towers contains a sand, lime, horsehair and oxblood mortar. This is one of the few pieces of evidence to suggest that the round towers might themselves be of Christian origin as the same mortar was used in the construction of Roman buildings in Britain. The assumption being that British monks brought the Roman construction techniques and engineering skills to Ireland. However, as there are no similar round towers elsewhere in Roman or Christian Europe from the same era, one could also suggest if we dare to invoke the great Welsh Druidic revivalist and nationalist William Price and his assertion that the knowledge of the classical world had been stolen from the Druids, then the construction methods used of the round towers, the Romans in fact acquired from the Irish, who in turn had acquired them from a much older source. At this point, I don't dare to invoke the Atlantis idea, but I will leave the possibility hanging there for the viewer to consider. Another anomaly is that while early Irish round towers were constructed from stone and highly engineered, early Irish churches were constructed from wood. This then begs the question, why would the most important structures of the Christian community take second place 
to a round tower. Another matter is that an earthquake which rocked Ireland in 448 AD caused damage to 75 Irish round towers. This is mentioned in the annals and Christian scholars have gone to great lengths to contradict this saying that the annals are in fact recording either the destruction of ring forts or more bizarrely the destruction of Constantinople by an earthquake in the same year. Yet the Irish annals specifically mention round towers and make no reference to either ring forts or Constantinople. In 448 AD we are talking about a period in Ireland where the new religion of Christianity had barely made a dent and yet there were dozens of round towers already in existence according to a very specific citation within the annals themselves. Almost certainly these round towers were built long before St. Patrick set foot in Ireland. They may well explain why there is absolutely no mention of them in the religious history of Ireland during the construction of the first monasteries. And would also explain why they were not targeted by Henry VIII for destruction along with all the other religious buildings. They were pre-Christian in origin and were possibly considered secular buildings at the time of Henry VIII and later the Cromwellian Puritans. In the book Round Towers of Ireland written by the historian H. O'Brien in 1898 he goes as far as claiming that the Irish Round Towers were built by none other than the Tuatha de Danann who brought their design engineering and means of construction from their destroyed homelands beyond the sea. The book is rather remarkable for its time in that O'Brien's research was complex in scope and well thought out and presented. He even gives special mention to the Irish Druids as being the origin of all the other Druids, having a magic and a level of skill that was far superior to other forms of Druidism around Europe. These magicians of the Tour de Danon oversaw the construction of the Irish Round Towers orientated to solar and lunar alignments and were used on specific feast days such as Beltane or May the 1st. A professor Philip Callahan, an American who spent many decades investigating the Irish Round Towers, noted that Irish farmers valued the land around the Round Towers for their fertility they generated within the soil. In one case, he discovered that farmers ferried their cows in rowboats to Dervanish Island in Lower Loch Erne, County Fermanagh, so they could avail of the highly nutritious, lush and fast-growing grass around the base of the Round Tower. Callahan's theory is that the towers were constructed of paramagnetic stone, which contains a weak but detectable magnetic field and which independently and scientifically verified by Charlie Brooker during research for the New Scientist magazine in 1983 at various Neolithic and Bronze Age megalithic sites in the UK, and specifically the Roll Wright Circle. This paramagnetic effect allows them to act as giant accumulators of some unknown energy which may or may not be similar to Willem Reich's theory of orgone energy, and the charge created by the round towers energizes the surrounding topsoil resulting in increased yields and healthier livestock. As the Irish round towers are made from either granite or basalt, they are ideal for this purpose of collecting subtle energies in the atmosphere and charging them into the earth. If Professor Callahan's theories are correct, and I believe that Charles Brooker's 1983 research in the New Scientist magazine proves that they are, then a complete re-evaluation concerning all megalithic structures in ancient Europe, not just Ireland, would unleash a paradigm shift in terms of these sacred sites being no longer thought of as tombs or places of pagan sacrifice, and that many of the early Christian monastic settlements will in turn be revealed as being of a druidic origin and absolutely not an early Christian origin. Such places are in fact locations and structures built with a very specific scientific, artistic and magical purpose developed by a truly ancient civilization which has vanished deliberately from the historic records kept by Jesuits, 
and other religious orders. The achievements of this lost period of history was kept alive through magic, megaliths and mythology and lasted up until the arrival of Christianity in Europe when the cradle of civilization was deemed to be Babylonian civilizations which emerged between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia. As a result, the Atlantic and Eastern Mediterranean megalithic regions were reduced to the level of barbaric oddities on the edge of the civilized world. Atlantis had been completely submerged in every possible way. As my own research continues, I have come to the conclusion that it's almost impossible to find hard proof that there ever was an early Irish Christian identity and that Christianity in Ireland may well have taken up to a thousand years to gain a foothold within the population after the arrival of St. Patrick. Tantalizing clues and evidence exists for this everywhere. The continuation of Celtic croy petites all over Ireland long after the arrival of Christianity. The veneration of the pagan god Crom in County Cavan being reported as late as the 16th century. But most important and most revealing of all, the wholesale annihilation of Druidic and heathen culture by early Christian monks who took it upon themselves to co-opt, though not always with the most pathological intent, In some cases, St. Kieran at Clonmacnoise and other early Christian monks were simply druids who hid within the church, saving their own culture. However, after the arrival of the Norman conquest in the 11th century, things took a radical turn and the Christian ethnic, cultural, magical, historical and spiritual cleansing of the Irish and other European tribes began to take place in earnest reaching its culmination with the Frankish Empire. However, as testament to the glories that existed in Europe before the arrival of the Christians from the land of sand in the Middle East, remain not only the megalithic structures of Europe, but also the magnificent and incomparable round towers of Ireland. If you would like any more information on the topics spoken about in this and other films, you can check out my book, The Druid Code, Magic, Megaliths and Mythology, at the link below.